This may be the... Let's get close, but not so close. Quarantine. You can share from a distance. Quarantine. You know we want to see each other. We'll have to stay in your golden space while we talk. <laughs> Welcome to episode uh, 19 of Quarantine, uh, which means we've been at this for almost uh, 10 weeks. Uh, and if you've been following us from the start, you know what has interested us here has been all of the innovation that is going on just under the surface of the daily conversation about what the governor said, whether masks are a good idea, and uh, where the virus is. Uh, from the very start, what we saw was that innovation communities were kind of snapping to and working on both how do we handle social distancing? How do we start thinking about what gets built tomorrow? And the scientific community was mobilized and focused kind of as never before. And the other great interesting thing about this is we've all been on a similar system clock, like this trauma hits all of us at once, which creates this sense of path or mission that we're on. And as we get out to about 10 weeks here, of course, the world is now focused on what comes next. Uh, as everybody's focused on opening up. I think on one of the very early shows, we kind of posited that we thought that the whole COVID crisis might unfold in three acts. You know, the first act was the trauma of quarantine and the trauma of how do we social distance? How do we stay at home and what was going on? And, and that was probably for the first month. Then there was this realization that whatever is next isn't really normal, right? And this is the whole bit about... Uh, do we go back to downtowns? Are we working at home? What happens to the whole business of 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 live events and to our food chain and to the reckon to the reckoning of of economically what's going on? There's always something beyond that, right? Which is how how does a disruptive event like this accelerate uh, new technologies, new trends, and and science, and what lies beyond it? And on the very on the very I think it was our second show we had this conflict between getting organized for PPVs and immediacy, and then thinking about the world that gets built next. We never really jumped into this other question of how does a crisis accelerate either major technology trends that exist, retire others, uh, or bring new ones to the fore. And that's what we want to get into today. And kind of an interesting way of framing of this is uh, if you looked, not that it's a particularly lovely example, but if we go back to... Uh, to, to the Dark Ages and the Black Death, it was after the plagues that, um, that Europe hit the Renaissance, that printing got invented and kind of the modern era got created. And it was certainly after or in the midst of the trauma of the depression that uh, a lot of our social mechanisms today got built. So today what we wanna to focus on is what we're calling 
the bubble and the inevitable discerning signal from noise in deep technology. Um, and we have two terrific guests today. We have Steve Jurvetson, who is a, a, a dear friend and has been an investor whose thesis has always been what's inevitable over the next 50 years. And if it hasn't been invented, let's get on with it. And evidently he's been pretty good at that because Steve was the first money in Hotmail in Tesla and in SpaceX, which will have astronauts next week. Um, and a lot of the theses and bets that he made really are very appropriate right now. So we're going to be talking to Steve about a wide range of things that are both on the IT and on the uh, life sciences arena, and they come together. And then uh, Andrew Hessel, who was on us on the with us in the very first episode, who's a synthetic biologist. Uh, well, we're really finding this is th this is the moment for that because it turns out that 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 all forms of manufactured and synthetic biology sit in the solution spectrum for um, for problems of pandemics. And when we were talking to Andrew earlier. We kind of realized that that what what the dot com bubble was to 1999. Perhaps life sciences and finding um, uh, a, a COVID tests or, or, or genetic-based tests for, for, for the disease are today. It's a gold rush. It's a bubble. But it's also huge amounts of money are flowing in, and they will help us build the future. So this show is really going to be focused on what is going to get built and what the landscape looks like with two of the best technologists in the world, actually three of the best technologists in the world, because joining me is my co-host, Mickey McManus. Welcome, Mick. Hey, Peter, how you doing? I'm doing great. Look, the microphones are working. The headphones are working. We've made it Some this far. Okay. Yeah, this should be fun. I mean, I think I'm just happy to be a, a bit of a sidekick for you, Peter. So I think this will be interesting. Uh, by the way, we do we are uh, streaming this on a bunch of sites. So Twitch, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn Live. And we also have the, the Miro, the infinite whiteboard that we're just experimenting with. Um, Omid, can you pull up the whiteboard for a second? Um, just to give you a sense, this is today. We're we're going to be talking to to Steve and and Andrew. Um, but if we were to pull back, we'd kind of be able to see um, the sessions that we had last week and the sessions that we had the week before and the conversations. And our hope is in a future episode to use this as kind of a collaborative uh, whiteboard where everybody is working together on a particular uh, challenge or problem framing uh, effort. And and we'll talk more about that later. But I just wanted to give a little overview. Back to you, Peter. That's right. Um, Okay, well, let's. I we should just ask Steve to join us because we could spend uh, all afternoon and more with Steve. Steve, welcome, and let's and and, and make you welcome right. also. Uh, well, you know, uh, one of the interesting questions here that I'd love to ask you is: is in the in the venture world, as you're looking at all of this, what what has changed as you've looked at things in the last couple of months, and what is this reinforcing? Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, that shows up both in terms of, I assume, investment theses, but also you're working with a bunch of startups, uh, which all of a sudden have a very different world. Yeah. Um, coming off that cheery music we just heard, it reminded me sort of the Smiths, you know, like really g g gay and light um, sort of melodies uh, for dark topics. But uh, in any case, uh, in some ways, uh, it's a good crisis pairs startup business back to its core essentials as opposed to changing it. In other words, it's almost as if when you have an abundance of capital and money comes too easily, the things get distorted into bizarre world. Uh, the vision fund throwing money left and right and center distorts reality as it should be and pairing things back helps. So, you know, as I look back over the crashes economically um, that I've witnessed as a venture capitalist, the dot-com crash, the 2008 crash, um, those have been the best times to start companies. Uh, Tesla launched in the, in the middle of the 2008 crash. Um, there have been great companies formed at this time. And the main, one of the main reasons is you can iterate with customers rather than chasing the next financing event. You know, instead of investors being important to your business model, it's your customers that are important to your business model. And uh, that's just a healthier way to build a business. You scale better, you iterate with customers, you build products people care about. So I actually love an environment where money is harder to come by versus abundant and um, you can imagine that if there's no evolutionary pressure, you just get a bunch of noise. So I mean, hence the title, you know, noise and winnowing nuance from the noise. Um, one other point you mentioned looking you know, back over the long arc of history. And um, I, there was a tabulation I first did in 2010 and I just updated it or the Dow Jones Industrial Average Company. So those who have risen to at least that uh, moniker of being the top you know, companies in America. And um, the super majority of them were founded during a recession or the Great Depression. 
which is kind of remarkable. Uh, people generally set out to and do succeed to build world changing companies in down markets. And um, one of the uh, sort of reasons I think that's maybe obvious beyond just the culture that you build, as I alluded to, or the financing environment, is that um, you, uh, you, I guess you could think of it just simply that what is the opposite of tumult, volatility, you know, crises slash disruption? What's the opposite is stasis, continuity, predictability, and in those environments, the big get bigger. And so in a very abstract way, the only way a new entrant has a chance is if something is disrupting business as usual. Otherwise, there would be no new entrants. And um, so we thrive on this, like a good financial crisis. You know, we know that black swan events are going to come more rapidly than ever before. And that's great for new entrants. And that's good for the world because new entrants lead all meaningful change. Um, uh, maybe I'll end it with that. But I mean, that's just the most you know, deeply held belief I have in business is that there are no exceptions to this rule. <laughs> yeah. You know, when, when we started talking yesterday, you know, I was suggesting, well, maybe a whole bunch of new theses are on the table. And in fact, when we were talking to, to, uh, to Tim Chang a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how, well, there's the whole work at home thing versus the downtown thing. Uh, mm -hmm. We see all this trolling of the internet, but now we're using the internet for more social purposes. But you were pointing out that your philosophy has been look out 50 years, ask, mm -hmm what's inevitable, but no one ever did, and then do it, which would suggest that that's almost like a longer term smoothing function. In other words, you look at things without these perturbations. And so I'm wondering, kind of from your perspective, what are the things that are reinforced? And, and what mm. and what perhaps are you seeing that's new? Interesting. Let me let me do some background thinking on your question. Yeah. The, um, because the first part of your preamble made me want to at least re you know, emphasize what you said, which is, if you look out 50 years, uh, and the reason I picked 50 is it's far enough in the future that it's very difficult to think how you get to any 50 year future from where you are today. In other words, chaining forward is actually a difficult exercise given current regulatory environment. Pick anything, the FDA, autonomous vehicles, pick any drones, pick anything that seems like it's new and important. And if you say what's going to happen over the next five years, good luck. Um, if you instead say what's the inevitable future of 50 years from now, things become crystal clear. All vehicles will be electric, all of them, right? All vehicles will be autonomous all of them. Um, we won't kill animals for meat. We'll get to that later. But that was one of those epiphanies. It's like, well, of course, how could you imagine this? And if, by the way, if for a moment you doubt that that's the inevitable future 50 years from now, just make it 500 years. Ask yourself, will we be drilling oil out of the ground and burning it in little 20% efficiency engines to get around the planet 500 years from now? No, of course not. It's impossible for that future to be true. So it becomes a question of timing and you know, market entry and segments. So we'll get to that later. But this starting point of trying to invest in inevitable theses um, is pretty simple, frankly. It makes forecasting a lot easier if you just look so far in the future that you don't have to worry about the present. Um, so I don't know, maybe some people perceive that as hard, um, but I actually think it's quite, quite a bit easier. So when you ask what's the same and what's different, you're right on one regard, which is as I look at our existing portfolio, the companies we, by the way, I started a new venture fund about a year ago with Mariana Sanko from DFJ, two of us started this fund. So I think about, when I talk about our portfolio, I'm talking about the new one. We've invested in 15 companies and when COVID rolled around, we looked at them and we're like, you know, we're not really sure at first blush this affects any of them. Um, because they're so far out in their dreams and aspirations, whether it's nuclear fusion or boring or neural link, it's not like they're gonna stop. And the metaphor, or not metaphor, the analogy I like to use is that if you look at Moore's law over 120 years, the abstraction of Moore's law, which is just how much computation can a dollar buy, um, which is my favorite graph of all time, uh, it doesn't have any perturbations from recessions, you know, the Great Depression, World War I, World War II, it continues unabated. And symbolically what that means to me as a reminder is scientists don't rest during recessions. Inventors don't stop inventing. Technology doesn't abate. Their, humanity's capacity to compute continues uninterrupted over 120 years. And so we just count on that, right? And count on that for forecasting. And uh, any company that's doing deep tech, really crazy things are gonna take a few years to get to market. In a sense, other than work at home, there isn't much that's disrupting their world right now. Now, now I say that with, with some caveats, there's certainly disruptions, but it's not like uh, the restaurant industry or you know um, anything in the you know in the Virgin. You know, I feel for poor Richard Branson. Everything in his portfolio was almost like the uh, the opposite, right? Things that are dramatically impacted by that. So um, the things that will have changed, of course, is there's and we can get into this maybe in follow up questions if you'd like. There's a lot of new opportunities get created. Um, the work at home mandate, 
the need for edge intelligence, the uh, need for autonomous vehicles, the push in China, especially for uh, getting off public transit, interestingly, at least for a period of time. Uh, and, and then a broad category of disruptions to the supply chain. So companies and countries, countries like Singapore and companies like every company that manufactures something, um, have realized some surprise they, they may not have thought about before, like systemic risk. Um, and we'll get to the meat industry later, but like that's a gr perfect example. It's like you thought you had 10,000 suppliers. Oh my, look what can happen when you have a pandemic uh, uh, you know, at, the, at the animal host level across your entire supply chain, you, you, the level of systemic risk is huge. And so uh, a drive towards alternatives, sustainable alternatives, plant-based alternatives, what have you, um, or in the case of vehicles, you know, personal electric two-wheelers in China just exploded after the last SARS outbreak, the last coronavirus scare in China, where there are now 200 million of these vehicles in China. And just pause to let that magnitude sink in. There are more electric vehicle drivers in China than there are drivers in America. And it's largely due to SARS. <laughs> when I say largely due to, it may have happened on a slower trajectory and reached perhaps almost as high as it is today, but it certainly has accelerated in that after years of regulation, policy, directives, trying to encourage this, SARS happens and boom, it just, it just takes off. And it's like, I mean, I can show you a graph later, it's, it's mind boggling. And uh, this time around, the same thing's happening. So subway ridership in China, which has amazing subways, is down 40% year over year, even after reopening and uh, people move to personal transport. Um, now, luckily, some of these electric autonomous vehicles can actually be more efficient than public transportation uh, in certain cases, and that's good news. So it's not like this is a retrograde move. It's sort of accelerating move to the future. Um, but let me just back up. Country, countries like Singapore and others that face supply chain sh shocks are like, oh my God, we've got to like pick, figure out a better way so we're not like totally taken out by the next one. So Singapore is investing actively in nuclear fusion, for example, multiple companies. and. Uh, and then the meat industry, of course, is looking for alternatives in their supply chain, so they're not facing systemic risk. Um, let me ask a, supp a supply qu chain question there. I was on a call the other day with one of the global consulting firms, and they did one of these things where a bunch of people are brainstorming and putting up stickies, and it was one pessimistic meeting. And one <laughs> of the key pessimistic points was, well, the U.S. and China are going to kind of devolve into nationalism, and then supply chains, which have been optimized for just-in-time and cost, are going to become because they have to be resilient and duplicative expensive then there's less r d because everyone's doing the same thing and so the world will be worse because we're going to be doing much more local manufacturing and therefore less r d and as a percentage less efficient uh and i was sitting there thinking well i i'm not certain of that and then i felt like the weird guy on the west coast <laughs> so i just thought i'd ask you when you hear talk like that about you know okay we're going to we need more resilient supply chains and we may not, may not all be on boats. Does that signal to you rapid inefficiency or lots of opportunity? And then how do you resolve the fact that if you, in fact, duplicate things, it won't just be more expensive? Yeah, good point. So you could, in many cases, you can see this uh, crisis, if you want to call it that, this, this external shock to the system as an activation energy to get you over a hump, hopefully to a better place. It is possible that decentralized manufacturing of meat, indoor farming, uh, cellular agriculture, um, other physical goods instead of one mega factory consuming all a distributed set of manufacturing locally could have benefits. For example, uh, think of any manufacturing industry, having a local supply chain build, you know, producing products in the same continent at a minimum as where your customer is involves a lot less transportation costs, right? A lot of less overseas ships. And in many of these businesses, the sheer inventory carrying cost of stuff in transit for, you know, work and process inventory is kill. It can kill you. And so there were, certain forces towards um, lowest cost labor globally for manufacturing and companies like Nike and others chasing that around the world as they kept moving to new locations and you know very inefficiently building entirely new manufacturing facilities in each of these new economies that they were going to you know, quote exploit starting with Shenzhen and then moving you know to you know, cheaper places or you could say hmm, might it be better to build more of this stuff robotically the way Nike and you know most new automotive plants would do so that if you're tethered to the past and a sort of sunk cost of an employment base and, and plant and equipment somewhere, yeah, it's hard, hard to make a change. But if you have to build new factories and new locations, doing so with the latest modern methods may actually get you to a much more efficient place on the far end. Um, 
by loose analogy, buying a new electric vehicle is much more efficient than buying a used gas burning car. And that used to be a debate where people used to think it was the other way around, that buying a used Prius is a better way to go than buying a brand new electric car. But it's actually, if you look at the total cost of ownership from an emissions point, from a sort of emissions and greenhouse gas perspective, it's better to buy a new electric vehicle. So just by analogy, a new modern robotic plant close to the customer may actually be globally more efficient than the mega factories of the past. You know, hey, um, wait, I want to jump in for a second. Um, so, Steve, you mentioned this sort of it, it, it opens up this activation energy, right? People have been talking about more robotic manufacturing, more hyper local, you know, recomposable micro factory things. But, you know, the economics didn't quite work out and, and you know, it was all just in time and it was working. Um, and yet I, I saw a statistic that said 70 percent of the spare parts that are manufactured for cars are never used that you have to make them the first time because the factory can't be rebooted back to like a 2016 volvo in 10 years if you need a, if you need a part um, but if it's in the cloud and you just produce it locally then the actual cost is not only the the spare parts that you just had sunk cost for you know materials but also keeping that that warehouse warm and keeping everything else and all the supply chain risk so it does seem like there's this opportunity to say, how do we have um, a little bit more hyper local, or at least approximately, you know, just move weird things uh, far, but most local things probably can be a circular economy, or we can look for other ways of actually kind of being a little bit more uh, uh, more efficient in this. You also meant, I, I, so I just wanted to wrap that in there because mm -hmm. I think it matters. But you mentioned, you know, sort of forward chaining won't work when you when you're trying to forward chain. You're, you know, from today to the five years from now to 10 years from now. But then you said, but if you actually go and see what's inevitable, backward chain. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that was a, a beautiful way of thinking of it. But you also told us the other day, you have sort of the what's inevitable in 50 years, but you also look for things you've never seen before, sort of right. things that just open your eyes. Can you can you elaborate a little bit more on that, sure. that part of it? This is fascinating. It actually harkens back to something I learned back in when I was doing a master's in engineering is a course by Kathy Eisenhart, I remember, about, um, and she wrote a book, I think called Simple Rules or something. Basically, a most of, more of a systemic and process-based perspective on how innovation happens and how um, we make decisions in complex situations or how you could, uh, in a sense, build a good business uh, over time. And, and separately, we can get into this because there's all kinds of abstractions around this, a focus on process, not product, a focus on iterative learning, a focus on iterative algorithms, and anyway. But one example is, what is this? And I, and so it was only maybe four years into the venture business that I first thought of this. I, I was too busy learning the venture business to actually reflect on, is there a simple rule that defines how I choose one investment over another? And it was around the dot-com crash when I was completely losing any interest in everything.com. So every B2C, you know, consumer internet company, as they were called in the day, or B2B trading exchange, which was all the rage where all the money in theory was being made, they were all starting to look the same. And, and this was my trigger event, this, well, this epiphany was when I got um, actually the fourth business plan in total for just selling pantyhose over the internet. Uh, Gazelle.com got venture backed, and there were three others on their heels, like just selling pantyhose. Like there's so many levels at which that's wrong to me. Uh, but I thought, am, am I going to have to sit through pitch meetings like this for the next year? So I switched completely uh, to what we now call hard tech and, you know, optical integrated circuits, quantum computing, um, molecular electronics, synthetic biology. Those are, that's in the 2000 onwards. That's what I was investing in. So, but it was around that epiphany, around that insight that I realized, aha, what makes sense in retrospect as a rationalization for what I've been doing intuitively is that I've always tried to invest in something that's unlike anything I've seen before. Hmm yet adjacent to something I know a little about. So not just randomly go off and do real estate investing, then oil and gas, then distressed debt, because I don't know anything about any of those, but in a sense, and, uh, adjacencies to past experiences. So I started, of course, what I studied in school as an electrical engineer by training, came in and having done a lot of software programming, you know, the internet and software and chips, that all made sense. That was you know, adjacent to what I'd studied, even though it wasn't squarely in the domain of my studies. Um, and when I pivoted to nanotech and molecular electronics, again, was in the electronics domain and, and then sort of opened my eyes to biology and synthetic biology over time. Make a long story short, through a series of adjacent frontier explorations, I've realized this is actually entirely what we should embrace in our new fund. My partner, Miranda, agrees, luckily, organically on her own, that this is interesting on so many levels. First, you naturally 
explore the frontier of the unknown. You don't rest on your laurels and just keep investing in the same you know, genre of thing, whatever it is, enterprise software or something that after 10 years, really, it's going to be boring as hell, right, for an investor. Um, you are always renewing yourself. You can't um, get sort of complacent and lazy. You get portfolio diversification for free because you're not just loading up the boat with something that has systemic risk across your portfolio from an investor point of view. And um, almost by definition, you're going to places where most of the rest of the venture world isn't because there are no market studies to give you confidence. There's no warmth of the herd. Um, you, you can make mistakes, by the way, of course, and you know, march off into a sector like VR or nanotech, but you know, in my own case, uh, prematurely or in ways that just never are gonna materialize to be as big as people thought initially. And so it's not like you can't fail, you absolutely can, but I think it's a lot easier than any other strategy I've seen people try to pursue, like just bold face competition in the warmth of the herd of, you know, the, pick the hot area of venture capital and do that better do that smarter, yeah, have a yeah. better network. Like, good luck. You know, it sounds on. boring too. Yeah. And it's also boring, right? Yeah. Like I can, I know that I'll be just as excited 10 years from now as I am today about my job because it'll be completely different. And, mm. and I know that because I look back 10 years, there's no way I would have been able to tell you the portfolio companies I've invested in. Like mm. almost none of them, except maybe AI, would have even been on my consideration set, like synthetic meat, mm -hmm. nuclear fear. I'm like, no, they're like, no, right? You wouldn't coming, have thought of that, yeah. Right, especially coming off the dot-com crashes, like semiconductors, software, and life sciences. That was it for the venture community. Like, mm -hmm. There was nothing else. I mean, you could invest in automotive, you'd lose your money. You could invest in anything else. You're just like, no, like mm -hmm. none of that was a proven success area. And now it is so diverse, right? Every industry is opening itself up. This is a side thesis that you know to being re-engineered as a software uh, business. Yeah. You mentioned uh, edge computing devices or edge, you know, mm -hmm. devices with intelligence at the edges. Can you elaborate just a little bit more on that? What what you're seeing or what you're excited about? Sure. So we've invested in four companies in this area. So full disclosure: chip companies, software security layer, well, so Mythic, Occam, Bridge AI, and Latent AI. And um, they are all looking at different parts of the stack. But but I'll, so I'll talk about them in a generality which is I believe that the major shift in computing right now that we're in the middle of is a move of intelligence to the edge. So rather than one just central brain or cloud service like an Alexa uh, you know, responding by sending your voice signal up to the cloud, analyzing it, coming back down and taking some action locally and responding, um, it's much better to do it locally for privacy reasons, for latency reasons, for network bandwidth reasons. You can't have an intelligent edge or the IoT, the Internet of Things, without collapsing the Internet and the cloud at the same time. It was. Actually, as an aside note, there's this wonderful analysis by Google that if if everyone just started using, okay, Google, some ridiculously short amount of time a day, like I think a minute of continuous use somewhere during the, or intermittent use somewhere in a day, if every one of their Android users did that, they would have to double the size of their data center. Oh. It's, like, it's, <laughs> it's just, it would collapse it. It's just way too much, even for Google data center, right? So moving intelligence to the edge hasn't been done because of power and computational uh, limits and, and cost of both. So cost per watt, cost per calculation. And dedicated silicon for neural networks from Mythic and others are cracking that nut. So imagine like a 40 cent chip the size of a button on your shirt that could do anything and everything that you that you'd need for let's say a home appliance as a thought experiment. Like any speaker independent, thousand word vocabulary recognition or in a security camera, recognize faces, recognize your face, right? You know, do all that work locally to minimize, you know, when you actually send uh, information up to the cloud on, on an anomaly, let's say, or, or a person of interest in your field of view. Um, so for any device you can think of, but, cam but cameras are the easiest, I think, to, to think of as, a, as an example, uh, they would be better. Like my Nest cameras are horrible. I had to turn them off the first month I got them because th they aren't smart. They're just really dumb for a, a smart thermostat, well, really dumb, maybe not camera, really either. dumb, yeah. right? Oh, and they're yeah. not, I mean, they have the learning thermostat. Like it, it's yeah. just complete and utter misdirect on, uh, on marketing. That's a nice thought, but they needed a lot. It's like saying I, I have an intelligent uh, pet, but I have ants, you know, like, you, know, like they, you need a few more neurons to have an intelligent pet. Well, and I, it seems to me like if we say inevitable, um, we've got proof cases all around us. We've got solar powered things called trees right outside. <laughs> There's an awful lot of computation going on. You know, Pando, the, the, uh, the stand of Aspen in, in Utah has been around for 75,000 years and it uses mycorrhizal networks to like get different things like carbon atoms from dying oak and water from areas of drought to abundance. It's been running pretty long. It's like a, an internet of trees. And mm -hmm. it's got lots of computation and all those different things. And we call those life, you know, it's cells and bacteria and things like that. They all do little bits of computation. And it, it, it and I liked your point about privacy, right? If you could do it on the device, you could just send the the metadata or the, the result mm -hmm. or something exactly. else and not be sharing, you know, 
that person's wearing this thing on this too, you know, whatever, but just sharing, Hey, yeah, there's someone there. Yeah. Um, like when your Samsung TV was listening to you, it was a right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the way, we might sell all your data to somebody about what you're doing on your couch, yeah. but we, we don't know. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go one, Peter. Sorry. <laughs> you know, there was one disruption that I was thinking about last week that sparked that we should have this conversation, mm. uh, which, which was, um, you know, a couple of years ago we were talking and you were telling me about your investment in uh, meatless meat. And I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. animal, animalless meat, animalless meat. Exactly. Yeah. Motherless, cow, animalless, slaughterless. Yeah. The cow is a bad factory. And, mm. um, and I was, and at the time I'm thinking, mm. why did you pick that one? Now then, then we're sitting here last week and the, not only is the food chain disrupted, but then it turns out that meat factories are, are lousy to begin with, plus they spread pathogens, plus mm -hmm. uh, meat in general does, plus meat encroaching in, in, in grazing lands does. And I'm thinking here, here's this whole thing that could lead to a transition. And to give, so, and then I'm like, okay, that was a really interesting case of this. I wonder is what's causing what, so I want to call you. But two years ago, you and I were at South by Southwest and this is the first time we had this conversation. I want to play a clip just because I think it's kind of fun to go back and okay. see what we were talking about then. So two years ago at South by Southwest, we were talking about blockchain in the finance world. And I said, I want to throw a lightning round at you. What's going to change? Omid, let's take a look at two years ago and two months ago from now. <laughs> Steve, it's time now for the lightning round. Oh. What's getting disrupted next? No, I, well, the one that jumps to mind is agriculture. Is it a trillion dollar industry or soon to be one? Is it growing or shrinking as a percentage of global GDP? And is it one, again, that hasn't faced a new entrant, let's say in a thousand years, in terms of how you grow meat uh, in particular? And so there are some really interesting technologies that are just now ripe for using synthetic biology precepts, basically, you know, induce pluripotent stem cells that then become skeletal muscle and you literally grow cow without the cow. You don't kill a single animal and you end up with steak and bacon and duck and chicken. I've tasted this stuff, but actually anyone, anyone who eats meat ever visited a slaughterhouse, I'm gonna start asking. I don't no way. Wait, you, you eat meat though? I don't okay, know. are you in the meat industry? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanna hear afterwards why in the hell you would do this to yourself. Like, I, I don't think I could unsee it if I, if I went. <laughs> So, so here you brought us into synthetic biology, plus this interesting bit that we're not making the change for the moral reason. Although after it happens, we'll justify it. We were making the change because economically it was feasible. So I want you to walk through like the thinking on that, because that tells us a lot about how change happens in moments like this. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I myself was a meat eater, um, eight, 25 pieces of bacon in a single sitting, had meat of some sort in every single meal of the day, three, day, three meals a day at least. Uh, could not conceive a meal without meat. So that's my starting point. Yet I rationally, weirdly, uh, had the simultaneous realization that this is unsustainable, that this can't be the future. Like 50 years from now, I just can't imagine China follows the US as they come out of, you know, lower class rises, the middle class, meat consumption goes up, it's like clockwork, that will destroy the planet. They'll destroy Africa the way we destroy the Amazon, right? So the vast majority of Amazonian deforestation is for American grade beef in America, um, which actually comes from Central and South America. Um, so rationally, I knew that, but emotionally and morally and what have you, never sank in. Like it just, I could not connect those dots. So even though I was looking for years, I, I stated a goal with all these arguments around land use, water use, what have you, they want to invest in an alternative that could scale. I didn't believe that the first few companies I saw uh, using 3D printing and what have you were really the way to make meat. Um, and so I actually posted on, on Facebook this complete thesis of why it needs to happen and such, but I didn't change my own behavior. Then, and then there'll be an analogy to do the current shock to the system and supply chain in COVID, but when something forces you to not eat meat, you can look at it differently. And for me, it was a personal challenge to someone else. I wanted her to get stop smoking. She wanted, well, she didn't really care about me, but I said, hey, I'll give up you know, eating meat for six months if you give up smoking for six months, thinking she'll quit if you know, a lifelong habit if she can go six months. And, and that actually worked. She's no longer smoking, I'm no longer eating meat, but I thought I would. I thought I'd just go right back to it. And what I found happening in my own self is just a personal example of what I think happens for a lot of folks around cognitive dissonance of your personal choices, whether you're a smoker or a meat eater, is that you will not let those ideas sink in at any level. You will avoid the articles in depth. You will not go to the slaughterhouse, of course. And the analogy I would use is um, uh, the sort of moral retrospection we do around things like slavery uh, back in the 1800s or, uh, or, or whale fishing, maybe as a simpler example. Um, 
just one little factoid that's amazing. Coming out of the 1800s, whale hunting was the fifth largest industry in America. Fifth largest, that's pretty freaking big. No one was saying it's immoral. Uh, they were depending on it for whale oil for you know lighting lanterns. When kerosene came around and we had the economic alternative to whale oil, it switched remarkably quickly, more rapidly in a transition than you would expect because the moral argument suddenly kicked into gear. Like, oh my God, let's take a look at what we do to those poor whales shooting harpoons through them. And the outrage and outlawing of whaling took place after the economic alternative was better. Same thing with slavery. You say, hey, you don't have to own the slaves that are working in your field as sharecroppers or on their feudal system or what have you. You can have your same land and have an economic system that works. And that argument was a bit more of a leap of faith, but once the alternative was there, like uh, capitalism works, you can actually farm your land as a landowner without slaves. You could have this transition. However, that transition occurred, when people change their behavior, the morality follows. So instead of saying, I woke up one day, and change the way I think about morals or ethics and therefore change my behavior. That's what we think happens, but it's actually, I believe in reverse, that um, you, you are forced perhaps in a, in a pandemic to change the way you act and then you rethink the way you act. So let's say the meat shelves are empty at the local grocery store as they were for a while, there's a pork shortage in some part of the country and you, you only eat, can only eat the hot dogs and other crap meat that's there for so long, you eventually give that Beyond Burger a try or the Impossible Burger and they're actually fantastically great, wonderful tasting products, you consider that in a way you might not otherwise. So you, you get flipped over to an experienced good, like, wow, this is a great substitute. In this case, we're actually talking about a substitute that asks for some you know, potential trade-offs and taste and what have you. So it's not a perfect alternative. And so I think when the perfect alternatives come, in other words, just like the electric car is better than a gas burning car on every single metric, save one maybe until recently, um, these synthetic meats or lab-grown meats will be better on every single way. So it's not just Oh yeah, it will cost less to manufacture because you're not throwing away the majority of the animal. Uh, it will be healthier. Uh, you could actually have omega-3 rich steak if you wanted, but let's just say to start, it's identical. It's just cleaner, there's no E. coli. You buy ground beef that's made in a lab, you don't have the GI tract and all that gross intestinal stuff to deal with because you're not growing the intestines and you're not filling with crap. So it just doesn't happen. You may have pathogens, but the shelf life's gonna be much longer. It's gonna, I mean, they've already shown that. So it's just cleaner, so it's cleaner, it tastes better it's healthier, it's cheaper, and then, oh, by the way, you're not slaughtering animals. And that's when the majority of people will say, let's stop slaughtering animals. Right now, you have the forward-looking vegans and others who are, in some cases, militant about their point of view. A good friend of mine, Moby, the musician, has been that way for a long time. And there's a little bit of a disconnect with middle America where people like their meat, and they're gonna eat their meat, and they don't wanna hear from the vegetarians telling them they shouldn't eat their meat. I came from Texas, so I gotta like, channel the accent a little bit. Uh, <laughs> just having a little flashback there. Um, I can't tell you, like I, I once ate four pounds of steak in a single sitting, um, just, not, I was a meat eater. So um, I was having flashbacks now. So in any case, <laughs> the, I think the way you reach those people is by giving them an alternative. So in the current pandemic, interesting that when you had a supply chain disruption, people are forced to try something new and they realize it's better. It's not and so bad. There you yeah, go. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Hey, we should uh, like explore this biologic thing a little bit further, yes. Peter. Yeah. Sure. We're going to bring, we'll bring Andrew Hessel in here because, okay, we've oh, gone yeah. down this meat factor and one thing is consumer taste meat alternatives, but at its core, we are talking about the ability to synthesize uh, organic matter and, and, and proteins from scratch. And that also brings us down the whole vector of being able to take digitized information like Andrew, the digitized COVID-19, and then speed up the ability to respond to that by synthesizing vaccines and perhaps then speeding that up to anticipate. And Andrew, when we talked to you in the very first show, you talked to us about your work in synthetic biology, which is kind of the great hope in the biologic century in terms of being able to come up with new things. So the first question is, hello, and how has your thinking and the world of life sciences changed in the eight or nine weeks since we talked at the top of this crisis? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's great to be back. Um, what has changed? Um, one of the really important things for me is, um, is now there is a global awareness uh, of, of the power of biology over our lives. Like, it, it's funny because life is one of those things that you just don't really think about until, until it is disrupted in some way. You, you find a lump, you get a prognosis that isn't good, uh, you lose a friend. 
you get sick. Um, uh, I, it's been my experience that most people don't think about the architecture of life really at all, unless it's their profession. Um, and so the invisible world of single celled organisms like bacteria and yeast and, and of viruses has largely been ignored by pretty much everyone. So part of my, uh, part of my communications has been to educate people on on these simple organisms that are now becoming ex more and more accessible and manipulable with synthetic biology um, and trying to get people to think about the, the, the importance of these organisms in our life, in our world, in our food chains, but also think more about what needs to be done to prepare for a world where these are much easier to engineer. Uh, what type of applications should we be thinking of? How will it change things like agriculture and medicine and, uh, and, and just general health um, or food production? Uh, one of my favorites is just using yeast to make not meat, but to make milk. <laughs> That's been a, a really a real favorite. And just and just laying this foundation out and getting people to think, well, also how do you make the world Thank you so much. safe given that um, given that we are getting more ability, capability to go and engineer these 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 organisms? So what's changed for me is that lesson about the importance of these microorganisms, particularly viruses. Um, the the need for for new systems to be able to engineer them, to be able to detect them, uh, you know what we think of as testing, to be able to you know to be able to quickly use them to make vaccines, and the entire process that uh, uh, the regulatory regimes, etc. Uh, let's just say it's an easier lesson to teach right now because because we've got this this global disruption. And people are realizing, wow, there's there's been trillions of dollars um, uh, displaced um, in in terms of our economies. There's been incredible pain and suffering in in nations around the world. I don't have to teach that anymore. Now it's it's how do we come together to build a new system? That um, let me, let me ask a question. Let Let's start with kind of the present problem and then move forward. Um, the world has become aware that, as you told us last time, that the that the, the the genome of this virus reached our shores before it did, or perhaps at the same time, that this allowed people to start in on multiple vaccine paths at once. But it still takes a long time to do trials to figure out what works. We're not really simulating all of that yet. And then there's the whole manufacturing and supply chain stuff. So mm -hmm. it's a year, 18 months. And we know we're heading into a world where there'll be more disruption, more planned annex, more unplanned unexpected stuff. Um, does that get better? Kind of wh what have we learned from this and what might we expect in the next five, 10 years uh, so that this doesn't just keep happening to us or doesn't well, keep happening to us? What we're learning is the power of genomics in general. And I usually look at genomics as, as a programming language. And so there's there's kind of reading the code, there's, there's understanding the program, uh, comprehending the code, and then there's writing the code, the actual programming. The thing that's been really remarkable about this virus and how quickly we've been able to respond to it is genomics has gotten so good in terms of reading code today that the that the sequence of this new virus that was causing pneumonias in China uh, and I was identified um, at the end of December 2019, that sequence was published to the world uh, on January 10th by the Chinese researchers. And, and that set off a, a, a flurry of activity in terms of making diagnostic tests, uh, synthesizing key proteins that can be used for things like generating vaccines, and even completely synthesizing the entire virus particle so it can be moved into labs and, um, and, and studied. Um, the speed at which that happened with this particular virus uh, is, is unprecedented. With the first SARS, it took over a year just to get the sequence here, it, it took 10 days. And within uh, one of my favorite papers that was published uh, last month, within, within four days of that sequence being published, uh, a group in Switzerland was already synthesizing the entire virus genome so that they could reconstruct it and study it in the lab. Like that is, 
that's that's a remarkable acceleration. They were they were able to recreate the virus without receiving a physical sample from China in in about a month, and and within a, a week and a half, submit a paper to to Nature, one of the top scientific journals. So that's remarkable, but it, it it's still just opening the door. All the processes uh, for doing these types of studies. Uh, as as researchers, which are very granular and cellular, are, are aren't completely uh, collaborative yet. Um, we we there were vaccine candidates made within a few weeks by companies like Moderna and others. There's a number of different strategies you can use for making these types of vaccines, uh, but but the process of testing them and demonstrating that they're safe and effective. Uh, again, it, it's well known. It can take a, a year, a year and a half, uh, really doing it rapidly. Uh, often it's much longer. And and then just building up a body, a corpus of knowledge around a new a new biological agent it takes a while. Um, and you see all the, how interconnected all of these systems are from researchers and data scientists and geneticists to, you know, you know the various groups that make vaccines all the way to, uh, the hospital care centers and 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 your and your doctor's office. Uh, we're starting to see that the entire architecture is so fragmented and doesn't you know there's just it doesn't have a a, a common base that well, I think what will come that, out of this because I think change. that's the that's the interesting thing. It almost seems like there's a lot of people jumping on and going, I can do a vaccine. I can do it. I can repurpose just the way the three D print world. You know, everybody with a home printer is saying, I can make a a, a face shield or something. It seems like on the synthetic bio world, there's a ton of people who are just jumping in and going, yeah, actually I normally do cancer, but I can I can do this thing, or I, I normally do this or this, but it feels like there's a lot of fragmentary, uh, fragmentation in the whole place because we don't have a, there's no there's no like Android operating system for for designing, testing, producing, and and, and making sure life is life and works. Um, it, it's still kind of fragmented, but you you are the co-lead of the Human Genome 2.0 project. The first one was Read the Genome. That was pretty awesome, and that led to this incredible explosion You know, a, a number of years ago. Now we can actually sequence this stuff so cheap, but your one is about the Genome Write project. It's about writing a genome. What does it mean to do that? And, and I've, I've got a little visual here on the, on the whiteboard that we talked about a little earlier today. I don't know if... Um, uh, so, so you've got this dream of sort of saying, look, what if we get a push button manufacturing for a genome foundry? And you've got this kind of idea of a, of a four phase plan going from viruses, which you've described as USB sticks, um, that just sort of plug into a cell and convince it to do something, the cell's the operating system, to you know getting inside the nucleus of the cell itself and then actually developing new chromosomes. You've called it Chromosome 24, um, which I think is kind of interesting. You know, this notion that that we might have an extra chromosome that's a programmable chromosome that could actually be able to give us uh, safety and security, have dip switches or something, be able to turn things on and off. Tell us a little bit about what you envision for for sort of Genome Foundry One, Genome Foundry Two, Three, and Four. What what your whole vision is for this? Yeah. So just to back up the genome project, right, is, is, as you said, it's kind of the other side of the coin of the human genome project, mm. which was uh, the, the largest life science effort ever done in, in the public domain. Um, and it was to, you know, for an international group to work together to read the first human genome. And that was incredibly successful, kickstarted. Uh, it, it, it completed early and on budget, like uh, unlike most projects. That uh, that are founded in government programs and academia, um, and it has since led to this incredible explosion of biotechnologies and our ability to read the genomes of all living things. But what I thought was missing was the ability to write genomes, where and that's where things get creative. And we, in fact, we've been doing this for a while. Um, the first genome that was synthesized was actually two thousand and two. And that was a virus. Um, and in 2010, the first cellular genome was written. Um, it, it, but it's still early days. I think we were, as we were talking earlier, there's only been about 50 genomes that have been made synthetically um, from scratch. But my, uh, my intention with the Genome Project Right was to essentially set the bar really high 
and and create this this pull and of interest to for people to start writing genomes. And so if you say you're going to go at the time they were the meeting I was at where I proposed this, the the group of scientists were synthesizing the yeast genome, which is about 11 million bits of genetic code. Um, and yeast is actually a really great model organism for understanding. So wait, before you go yeah. too far, yeah. you just said the yeast is 11 million. I want to catch 11 million bits or base pairs or bits or base pairs. I use those, okay. those Got it. synonymously. So I want to go back to my drawing for a second. Maybe you could pull yeah. it up Omid and have uh, Andrew on the side here. Um, so, so yeast is, I just drew a piece of bread. I don't know. That's the best I could come up with. So yeast is 11 million base pairs, right? Yeah. So it's sort of kilobits or something like that. Um, how big is a virus? Like, uh, well, there's kind of a, you know, viruses range in size from being as small as 3000 bits, uh, hmm. to, to a couple million bits, but those are really outliers. Uh, most yeah. human viruses, uh, tend to be in, uh, relatively small, so between 10,000 bits and let's call it 50,000 bits. Um, it. There's uh, the the reason why human viruses tend to be small is because we have a lot of physical defenses that prevent mm. the virus from going very far into our bodies. Um, mm. uh, to give you an example, SARS-CoV-2 is about 29,800 bits. So uh, it, it's about okay. in the middle of that range. It's right around there, yeah. Okay. And because it's a respiratory virus, you breathe it in and it finds cells to infect. But So to get a sense of the scale here, though, your first, your first foundry, you want to you be able to basically have a push button um, and have this ability to sort of push a button and, and, and it does mostly in software. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what the first one is versus the second and why you want to do the first one first all the way up to the full genome. Well, what I'm particularly interested in is digitizing this entire process because mm. when you, right now we don't, we, we manipulate the genomes of organisms using software tools. So we're all, mm. we all have a laptop or a computer or a phone even that, you know, gives us the ability to, to manipulate a genome. What I'd like to be able to do is is really grease the wheels of then turning that DNA into mm. the organism itself. I'm only I'm particularly interested in the writing of complete genomes that mm. that define the organism. So right now, economically, the technologies for writing and assembly, like it's synthesizing and assembling DNA. Um, are still kind of in the first or second generation at best, um, and and they're still um, they're still quite expensive. We pay per character per bit when we mm. write DNA, um, and it's it's approximately just for rounding. Let's just call it uh, ten cents a bit. It, mm. It's a little bit cheaper um, uh, if you're in, in some situations, but. That if you're if you're stringing together a ten thousand base pair virus um, at ten cents a bit, you're spending a thousand dollars to write that genome from scratch, and wow. and okay. yeah. so that's so right now with the current technology for synthesizing and assembling DNA, we can only really build viruses. Um, uh, as, as a life form from scratch. Uh, we, we have demonstrated that we can build a bacterium, but mm. a bacterial genome, um, the smallest are about 500,000 base pairs. Um, so that's, that gets to be pretty expensive if you're, if you're synthesizing. And something like E. coli, which is uh, you know, one of the most well-known bacteria because it's the main bacterial component of our, of our intestines. Um, that has about a four and a half million base pair genome. So again, if, if we were to synthesize it, you know, even and give us a sense yeah. for what becomes possible here. When we were talking earlier, you were pointing, I mean, my first question was if more people are writing these things, doesn't that create a bio risk? And you're like, no, because then more people will improve and pick up, perhaps help build an immune system, but what are the kinds of improvements that we'll see as this happen? And Steve, you should come in here because I think you've both been investing in these kinds of yep. things. You sit here at the 
you know, right at the border between uh, the digital code and, and, and bio code and also the regulatory issue. So um, maybe from both of you, what this makes possible and Steve as kind of a person thinking out there in the future investing, the timing. Well, I'll, I'll just say that the push button genomes are definitely the inevitable future um, uh, because I, if there's one thing I can absolutely count on, it's that the cost of synthesizing and assembling DNA is going to get substantially cheaper, just like the cost of reading DNA got uh, even out accelerated Moore's law. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I'm, I can pretty much guarantee this because the equipment for writing complex genomes is in is in the cells. Like every time a human cell divides, it, it basically has to write a human genome perfectly, uh, you know, for the cell to 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 make a daughter. And and so I know that the equipment for writing full genomes, even complex genomes like our own, but plants and other animals as well. Uh, uh, just needs to be harnessed. And I think we're getting there. And what does that open up? It just opens up being able to design the metabolism of a cell completely with, with more and more specificity. Uh, today, it also is allowing the creation of subcellular components like proteins and enzymes and structural materials. Uh, but it, uh, and then the smallest genomes, viruses, as again, uh, I've described them as USB sticks, a way to load programs we're going to get really, really good at being able to program viruses for to do positive things. We've right. harnessed them, you know, for vaccines and gene therapies, et cetera. But now we're going to have atomically precise viruses. Okay, you mentioned one uh, using phages to build batteries. What are some of the things, uh, either of you, in the next 10, 15, few years that the manufacturing of these things will make life better? Oh, it'll be everything. <laughs> <laughs> Chemicals, nutraceuticals, food. Um, you, when you build things with atomic precision uh, in the biological domain, you start with all the areas where we interface with that. So these are organic three-dimensional structures, right? Food we care about, drugs we care about, things that interface with our biology. But these materials can also be designed to attach to inorganic services, has been shown for a number of years in a number of ways and computationally designed. So you could build things that bind to inorganics to make better solar cells, better batteries. Uh, just this morning, for example, I heard from a company, Sensei, that's using phage display to produce the proteins, specifically the four proteins for COVID that you want to generate an immune response. And the beautiful thing about these little bacteriophage, we think of them as little like lunar landers with a capsid and the little legs hanging down, is that when you display the proteins, um, well, first you use bacteria as you're manufacturing, you infect them, they pop out, you get tons more. And they make all these proteins, but the 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 bacteria, excuse me, the virus itself is the adjuvant. It's the thing that triggers the immune system. To say, hey, this is a virus. This is a bacteriophage. And then, oh, it's got all these COVID proteins on it. So the immune system has this beautiful response. It, just, just circling it back to what you can do in in times of um, times of cholera uh, with loving of the bug. Um, but no, this I think we are in just in a high level. And I'll hand it back to Andrew. We're in a renaissance of learning about the information systems of biology. We're able to we were able to read the code of life, as he pointed out. Now we're able to write the code of life. Actually, I was on the board of the company that did all those genome synthesis projects he just mentioned, from the virus to mycoplasma. You know, building the first synthetic life form. You know, whose parents were a computer. Just weird, mind-bending stuff. But the business applications right now are more in the snippets, something you insert into an otherwise interesting piece of biological code, whether it's a virus at the small scale or something that you insert you know, with cut and paste tools now with, with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and other tool sets that rather than random hopes to, you know, like, oh, like building things with boxing gloves on where you're working with Legos, you now can actually cut and paste with the precision of an author and you can borrow from the pages of the Book of Life all over the place to shotgun sequencing of ecosystems. You have all these great bits of code to explore, you know, you know, energy harvesting with rhodopsins um, or better chlorophyll, I mean, improving chlorophyll itself. This, it, it, it's mind bending, the number of projects that are going on when you well, In a sense, it's like it's a biological code. century. And mm -hmm. if we can get more into the right. code side of this. That's right. And, and in fact, I, I think, Andrew, you were talking about how in your Fab One, what you're trying to do is open this up so that you can do a lot more with the viruses without even having to put it in a Petri dish. You can, there's actually a lot of physics you can do to actually do QA, you know, qual quality control and, and things like that. So say a little bit more about sort of the leaps that you have seen small labs do, George Church's lab or something like that, but how do we democratize it? How do we actually open this up for 
for uh, really a biological century in terms of um, innovation. I, I believe it's going to come down to making biofactories or what they call foundries. Mm. Um, mm. And that's because right now, if you look at biology, it's really cellular. It's really fragmented. Uh, there, there are labs around the world, every university, every institution, many companies. Um, and and if you, if you, they, they kind of remind me of the very early days of computers where you had a room sized computer and, and each one of them were bespoke and, and that's how you did your work. And so there's all these, there's all these brilliant bioengineers, but they're all working with their own systems, their own tools, their own reagents, their own people, and nothing mm. is standardized. Nothing ah, is standardized. Interesting. And, and what we've seen with the advent of synthetic biology and companies like Ginkgo Bioworks and Craig Venter's companies is we're, we're seeing an investment in robotic architectures that mm. do the, the manual manipulations keep better records, are really standards-based, high throughput, and it is really making it like a factory. So most mm. of the companies today that in synthetic biology are building platforms that mm. really accelerate and, and improve the quality of, of R&D. Where I think it's going though, so, uh, and again, what, what I've tried to do for, for a number of years is say, okay, well, let's take that approach. We need a factory. But rather, if it's once the cost of building that factory drops to a certain point, it doesn't have to be a private factory. It, you can mm. now make it more of an open factory, an open foundation. And then you can start to, you know, they often say, well, the smartest people in the world, you know, aren't necessarily in your company. They're, they're all over. I'd like to start concentrating the knowledge of life science into these factories. So, so because everyone's got a pet virus or a pet cell that they've been, you know, working with for years. <laughs> but, you know, let's, let's get that knowledge. Everyone has a pet virus. Yeah. Everyone has a pet virus. Yeah. A pet virus. It, it's true oh, though. Wait, like, wait, you, the yeah. last time we talked to you, you know, or one of the times we talked to you, you just held up a virus that you had sequenced to help ah. cure a cancer in a canine that you had done with a, oh. with a CAD tool, basically. I don't know if you still have that well, around your well, house. So I was, <laughs> you know, I was very fortunate. You know, we, we met at Autodesk, but Autodesk yeah. is a company that makes CAD tools, computer-aided design tools. And I, I kind of twisted and nudged them to say, well, let's make some design tools for biology and, and let's kind of take a printer uh, uh, outside of the company, they were big in 3D printing, and let's let's mm. do the biological printing at a different facility, but make it robotic. Mm. And and we were successful prototyping that. We had a CAD tool for making a virus. The mm. com the compilation, turning digital DNA into molecular DNA, was done by a third party, and then the the molecular DNA was handed off to a robotic lab. One of these, uh, which is the way apps. to think about this is think of a yeah. cloud, a cloud of a cloud. shipping containers with robots inside, dipping and dunking, yeah. and cloning the cancer and cloning the well, virus. Well, in this case, kill it is an example. Yeah. yeah. In this case, they were booting mm -hmm. up the virus and demonstrating mm -hmm. that it was functional, um, mm -hmm. and and in fact, so we did that with a with a harmless virus called Phi X one seven four. Um, and just, uh, it was fun. And then we took it a step further and we made the world's first synthetic cancer fighting virus. It was a virus designed uh, to give a cancer cell a flu. Um, and we were working with a, with a veterinary scientist to make a, essentially a, a, a virus for dog cancers. And that uh, was incredible fun. And now we took that knowledge. And since I left Autodesk, we've built a, a, a factory for, the, for one virus that we uh, can now re-engineer in a really short time frame and, and even do things like target it to a particular cancer. So if you think is, of a virus really as a USB stick, then it's kind yeah. of got an app on it that happened to be like give a flu to a cancer app. Yeah. And the, the operating system was the, the dog's actual cells. The dog and cells, now, yeah. And now you just brought in uh, the, 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 one of the founders of Shapeways, which was the kind of massive distributed, um, uh, I guess, I guess uh, service bureau to be able to 3D print things out of gold or silver or platinum or metal. Uh, and he's helping you build this kind of uh, app store for synthetic bio. It feels like there's that part of it, but then the other part of this genome thing, your foundries is all about uh, the operating system itself. We're pretty far away from generating a completely synthetic chromosome. No, like, well, it depends how, on the chromosome that you're talking about. So a virus uh, has a chromosome too. Okay. Uh, and, and we can print those. 
uh, we've already demonstrated, um, you know, Craig Venter made the first synthetic bacterial chromosome, uh, and mm -hmm. that was 2010. It's already been a decade. Um, yeah. The most right. recent bacterial chromosome to be synthesized was E. coli done last mm -hmm. year, um, which was a, a significant accomplishment because it's about a, a 4 million base pair genome. But as the cost mm -hmm. of synthesizing a bacterial genome falls, yeah. Um, mm. Today, if you were to synthesize the E. coli genome from scratch, it would probably be somewhere between a half million and a million dollars if you put mm. in an order to the current companies. But now yeah. imagine a, a, a cheap, a better synthesizer, yep. yeah, and, now it's, and now it's $500. Yeah, and the price yeah. is yeah. coming down rapidly. It, oh, yeah. it, it's been going down more rapidly than Moore's Law. There's like Carlson's curve to that effect. And Gen no, 9, a, com a oh. company I was involved with, the Ginkgo Bot, is yeah. easily under a penny, a base pair. It's just not you know, available to others quite yet. Um, yeah. But they were well, in, the, in the midst of commercializing that. Yeah, and, and right now it's actually very cheap to synthesize small amounts of DNA, mm -hmm. but if you have to assemble it into a genome size, uh, that, that's where the real cost is, and that's where you need more validation steps. But, but the technology like will just, to, just to put this yeah. in, in perspective for, for our listeners, though, um, you've got 50 kilobits as a virus. It's a, it's a, it's a USB stick. Um, yeast or E. coli might be in the 4 million kilobit range. Um, and then a chromosome is 50 million might be but, like, if you went with the smallest one, the maybe uh, one, of, why. one of the chromosomes. The, the smallest or, human is, chromosome. Human yeah. Yeah. is 50 million. And then a full genome for like an animal or something like that, like, or a dog in my little doodle um, is more like 3 billion kilobits. Yeah. So that's the leap that we're seeing. And, and I think we are counting on both Moore's law, but also this sort of volumetric law of, of nature. And we've got, a, we've got an instruction manual sitting outside our house um, in some ways. And so that's, it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, I think, what, I th Oh, I think that the next generation, I think the improvements in synthesis and assembly technology will supercharge biotechnology because a lot of the yeah. monkey work in genomics will just become a print job. Um, yeah. And that, and as the economic barrier and technical barriers fall, I think we'll see an explosion of creativity. But again, I, I want to stress part of my thinking is, you know, we kind of have to cross this this chasm of viruses, um, mm. which are the smallest genomes to synthesize and clearly uh, the most disruptive to humanity yeah. um, in many ways. And so I think we have to really start thinking about biosecurity and biosafety in, mm. in this new synthetic context in a way that we haven't done before. So that's, what, that's the mm. silver lining for me with COVID. This, mm. is, kind of a, uh, this is kind of a training pandemic. And, and it gives us the opportunity to rethink the entire architecture and, uh, of, of how we detect these nanoparticles and how we can uh, defend ourselves against them. But also you as we start to engineer them, how we, how we do the forensics and figure Well, and out you mentioned that we don't even have a radar network. Like in, at least in World right. War II, we had a radar. Um, and you mentioned <laughs> Roswell Biotech or something. I don't know, I'd never heard of them, but they have a chip, I guess that has proteins on the chips and they've got like millions on a chip scale that can just, when a thing floats by, it can detect it, it not being used today for, for the radar network for us, but that could be built into everything, that kind of a, a radar network. We have to wait until ICU beds or coffins start rolling out before we know what's happening today. So, so we're kind of fighting against this alien World War III without knowing it. So you mentioned that, world, that, that viruses, which are like a, a blank word document in size, and then full genomes are like the maybe the third rail because that that worries people about like designer babies. Those are the two kind of most dangerous, and they're they're, they're the extremes of your fabs. You know, sort of the virus stuff, and then the full genome stuff. Um, but if we don't solve this, we're never going to get to the other side. Yeah, it I, turns out that the most provo oh, sorry, uh, I don't mean to step on anyone. Uh, it turns out that the most provocative genomes to engineer are those small ones, viruses, and the and then the human genome, and kind of everything mm -hmm. in between there's just not that much interest in, uh, at least today. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's where the real opportunities come. So, so I'd love to yeah. just push in on this question of the connection of a genome to sensing, or as Anne Greenberg said in a question to us, mashing edge computing with synthetic biology to do continual monitoring and testing. Because if there's one thing we've seen in this, um, it's an enormous information deficit, right? Where uh, 
it takes it takes a while to develop testing. The testing isn't real time. If you were actually able to pick up where viruses were in real time, you could understand how you should distance what you're doing. I mean, it'd be amazing if you actually mm. knew what was going on. You probably wouldn't, you'd have minor effects in the economy because it would only be around the very few people who had it. We don't have that. So a lot of stuff's got destroyed. So I'm wondering how that frontier plays out, both the technical portion of genomics and testing. And then maybe Steve, you have some mm. thoughts on the practical IT issues of how we actually deploy that in perhaps the Apple, Google, uh, uh, contact testing me mechanism and some of the uh, regulatory and uh, ethical issues our industry is facing <laughs> as we attempt to do that. Oh boy. Oh boy. No, no, lang no, lang no lack question of topic. question there, yeah. Did you want Andrew to start on? Yeah, so two things. One is let's, let's just, I'm just kind of interested in this, what's possible when you bring these together and we can do a better job, then let's just back up to the reality of where we are. Well, Peter, though, but your point, the, the question that, that was flashed up said edge computing and synthetic yep. bio, right? right. And uh, what Andrew had, I think, Andrew, you just filed an interesting um, patent or, or, or something in this space. Can you talk about that or not? Uh, well, let me just let me just back up and answer your question, then I'll, I'll touch on yeah. the IP. Um, uh, I think that the most powerful diagnostic tool that we have in general is just being able to read the code of the organisms around us. So the generalized test equipment is a better sequencer that can just pluck the any virus particles that happen to be floating by and, and look at the code level of what that particle is. Um, given the advances that we've done in DNA sequencing uh, and, and Steve, you use the term molecular electronics. I think that's really the, the incredible field for people to get into mm. today. It's literally the connection of electronics and biology in, in real time. And biology is always a little squishy and, and flexible, but the electronics are incredibly precise and robust and that intersection is amazing. Um, to that end, there are companies today that are using molecular electronics for a variety of different processes, both application development and development of core technologies, including things like DNA uh, sequencing. Um, the the patent I filed, and I, I'm 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 not a big patent guy. I, I tend to like the software world where it's a little more flexible, um, but. Uh, if you're building hardware, you really need to think patents. I filed one patent in the last 15 years, and it was for a new type of DNA synthesizer that is based on molecular electronics. And uh, it, it's more so that, you know, I see the future coming of where we'll be able to write uh, potentially millions of small genomes in, in a few minutes using this type of, of technology. Today it's being used for being able to sequence uh, genomes in minutes. Um, but uh, like uh, this is such an exciting time to be working down at the nanoscale, both with semiconductor based systems and with biology, which is kind of really powerful nanotechnology with a programming language that's becoming easier and easier to access. Yeah, did you want me to um, pick up on that? I, so this idea of the edge and and bio, um, so the synthetic genomics, Kirk Venner's company um, that was mentioned is doing a bioprinter. It's a remote like desktop genetic printer. And they've shown with DARPA and others that you can, you know, find a virus somewhere and, you know, you know, wherever it emerges, you know, beam the data, of course, you don't have to physically ship samples and start generating, um, you know, both, you know, antibody therapies and vaccines remotely. The challenge uh, and then the risk at the same time is now you're distributing and democratizing the ability to create um, weapons of mass destruction. And this is the other, uh, you know, sort of mega theme of the uh, of the last century is that that's the inexorable trend that we're moving to an area where individuals with a little bit of background could, you know, do mm. great harm. We uh, There was a mention of this sort of being a trainer pandemic at the beginning. And I think that's uh, true uh, in more than one way. The, the way that jumps the most to mind is in terms of our uh, systemic and societal responses. Um, the societal immune system, if you will, versus the individual uh, biological immune system. And we found to be woefully wanting. Um, there were, uh, you know, by Larry Brilliant and others, techniques that the TED Prize funded to detect early what's going on in the field. So you can detect biologically, it's sort of um, normally released and normally evolving kinds of pathogens. Um, that was shut down just prior to this pandemic. Then you have, of course, the much greater specter of a bioengineered uh, weapon, right? So remember that, that smallpox has killed a billion humans. 
in an aggregate total. And there's like a deity in the Hindu religion, Shatala Ma, named after this, this incredible pox on humanity. And when we talked about animal agriculture, whenever you have dense people, animals, mm. what have you, you have pathogens that naturally crop up to take them out. It's like nature abhors a concentration, I would say, the, the opposite of a, of a vacuum, if you will, from the physics domain. And so it would be great if we had detection modalities. It's not just a better sensor, it's, it's the human systems for deploying them in the right places, taking action. Uh, what, is, what is your quarantine policy if you find interleukin-4 spliced into smallpox, right? So smallpox alone might be, oh, that's pretty bad. We have some immunity. But interleukin-4 spliced into it, well, shoot, within mice, that kills like almost all of them. In the vaccinated mice, it kills 30% of them. So imagine your, mm. your death rate after a vaccine is 30%. Think about how that would change the current pandemic. Um, mm. Healthcare workers wouldn't go to work. Doctors wouldn't do their job. People would flee everything. It'd just be a nightmare. So um, I think in some yeah, ways, I don't want to sound like a downer, but like we are cutting our teeth on this on the bio world. And a it is a precursor. Yeah. Like, I, like this is why I don't worry about AI or nanotech taking over the world because we'll cut our teeth on bio threats long before we even have those threats. And we got to figure out what we're going to do about it. And, and yet, I mean, you just mentioned what is, what's our policy on this and what's going on. It seems like so much of these things are moving faster than any regulator policy regime that's in yeah. place right now. Yeah. Um, you know, are we going to yeah. end up needing? Yeah, I mean, I got to say, know, the, the FDA, policy, I, 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 learned this, need? I learned some of this this morning. The FDA may claim they're doing fast track of stuff, but they're mm -hmm. they're captured by cronyism as they always would have been. And, and, and it's just insane, actually, how hard it is to get into a vaccine, to get any feedback, right? on a new modality. And there's some great modalities, computational approaches, phage-based approaches. There's hundreds of really creative ways to test out vaccines, but because of the downside risk, which is visible as an FDA failure versus the upside potential, which is less visible. Like, did you approve something 10 times faster, right? No one's judging the FDA on that. They're judging them on the occasional mistake that got through. And so it's gonna be very difficult for them to change. I mean, this kind of raises the general issue of, um... We've built governance systems to be deliberate and slow, and we live in a world of of exponential changes, including things like this popping up. And then we also have this kind of, for whatever political or uh, uh, kind of psychic reasons, this kind of anti-science haze or this questioning of vaccine haze going on. And it, it sounds like all this stuff holds us back, or there's great possibility, but there's there isn't as much will for it. And, it, it. and, you know, we live in an era where kind of because of climate change and the nature of employment, it's a little bit of a downer. And yet I think back to when I was a kid and people were excited about the space age. They're excited about computing. They're excited about new sets of technology. And I'm just I'm wondering if either of you come up against, um, you know, is is it just cronyism that's holding us back? Is it a lack of appreciation of these things? I guess I'm asking more of kind of a political and media kind of question of, you uh, uh, what, what are the mechanisms that that we can overcome this stuff or speed speed this stuff up? Because uh, uh, what we've identified is these are the right technologies and the important places to speed up the innovation cycle, but we have artificial mechanisms that we may need to move beyond. Well, did you get the question out of that? Yeah, I, I, here's here's the way I've approached it personally. Um, as, as a way to accelerate. There's some people that are much better prepared than me to go and create change in regulatory regimes. Um, I, I, over a decade ago, I sat down and thought, well, what can I do as an individual, um, you know, without a big pharma company, not even really being affiliated with the university because I, I have been independent for a long time. How could I create change? And then I realized if I can't win in the current system because it's so expensive and so onerous, why not change the system? And, and so I started to focus on, can I build a platform that would allow me to make a real and powerful therapeutic for one person at a time? Uh, because you can't do a, mm -hmm. a physical, you can't do a, a clinical trial, a phase clinical trial, for you know, for for one person, it's, <laughs> it's so this is sort of n equals one. N equals to. one. It's designed and, for you. Yeah. It's watermarked that it only works with your genome. It's it's built within the design tool. Is yeah, that where you're going with this? this sort of, 
So that's why I focused on building a platform mm. to to design and build viruses uh, because they were they were within reach of the current tools. But also, mm. I could build a virus therapeutic, whether you know it was a cancer fighting virus or mm. uh, or a gene therapy. I could build it with this platform for one person. And, and I felt that the, the challenge of getting an approval from a regulatory agency was within reach because I could get that approval, you know, in general for the platform, but in specifically for, for use with a single person, um, even just around compassionate use, uh, you know, all other, all other pharmaceutical approaches have been exhausted. And, and so that to me was the reasonable way to start opening this up. Now, vaccines are actually some of the most complex uh, drugs to get approved because they're preventative. They're, you're, you're trying to prevent a disease and, and you're, it's going to go into basically everyone you know, uh, and so th that has a very high bar. But if you're talking about building a therapeutic for a child that that has a genetic disorder where there is no drug available, or or a cancer patient that has used every possible treatment and and is now uh, is now being overcome by their cancer, the, those are are n of one possibilities. That's that, very clever that, because you you are rooting or you are routing around all of the resistance mechanisms or kind of institutional um, uh, friction that would stop that because the, that's all designed for mass kind of stuff. Plus you're going right into very interesting success stories, right? So that's kind of a clever way for you, in this case, you the pathogen to route around the regulatory structure to, to survive and come up with something cool. I like that because uh, that plus education works and then you don't have to take on the whole ball of wax. Yeah, and you can still build a very robust process, very regulated with all the security features, etc. It's just, it's, it's much more like a 3D printing paradigm. And which is why, you know, as you mentioned, Mickey, my, the CEO of, of the company, and, and he came on board as a co-founder, um, his experience was building 3D printing as a, as a service. And now we're just now we're just printing a, a molecular, you know, bio but, but, but if I understand correctly, like right now, though, mm -hmm. there are some private companies that are doing amazing things. You've got Ginkgo, you've got Twist, you've got other things, but but not nobody particularly is focusing on, OK, an end to end supply chain all the way up to human genome that actually has code review built in that has oh, sort no, of no. check in, check out and things. That uh, no, I well, yeah. Tell me, Steve. What, well, I mean, there's some there's, there's some code review in the sense that from for a bio threat perspective, nothing yeah, that comes out of the bio yeah. printer, you can't just like print smallpox backwards and like you know sneak it through. But no, that no, might, no, that yeah, might be a no. cat and mouse game. Yeah. Um, I meant more like you, the, the tracking, all on, the things we have with software that that are kind of like well and mature about kind of understanding the evolution of software code and how it I, branches I and things. But I maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. I personally don't think that's the yeah. bottleneck because the complex oh, system so far exceeds human understanding that it's not for want of design tools or coordination mm. between agents. I think it's a process modality of how we build complex ah, systems. Do we evolve them? Do, you know, do we understand how we're interacting with the human body and our immune system and what have you? So it's not, um, I don't mm. think it's like, like, like if you looked at a digital challenge in software and said, well, we're doing purposeful design, we understand the software artifacts we build, how can we scale human ingenuity so that teams can build products and we can have collaboration? And that's the entire history of, you know, yeah. everything from object oriented software frameworks to, you know, middleware and what have you. In the biological domain, you quickly hit a barrier of understanding. Or like you humans either, might not ever be able to understand. Well, exactly. We'll never understand our brain. Yeah. We'll create an kind of like we can't understand our children, yeah. I think. Exactly. But we'll create intelligences like children and AIs yeah. long before yeah. we understand how they work in the innards. So you so, have a thesis that yeah. this is almost like raising a child or, or parenting. Yeah. Uh, I think it's in, the, the, the engineering reality of the future will be more like parenting than programming, and it'll be more hmm. like uh, directed evolution than intelligent design. But one thing uh, I, I definitely want to mention, bouncing off Andrew, we're talking about 3D printers and uh, routing around, uh, or at least trying to get through the FDA morass quicker and doing so um, digitally is our most recent investment, Prelis Bio is doing all that. They, they take yeah. the COVID virus, they, they literally 3D print human immune um, lymph nodes, right? The mm -hmm. of your lymph nodes. Ah, this is the they, lymph node, yeah. The immune, yeah. The T cells much more rapidly by basically externalizing the immune system. And they've already got 300 antibodies, human antibodies, yeah. which as a therapy, unlike a vaccine, you can't overdose on. You could take as much of that as you want. You can take 10 times as many as you need and it won't hurt you. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that that'll be a faster regulatory path to mm -hmm. hit all those points. But it is sad 
that personalized medicine, regenerative medicine, cellular therapies are asking the FDA to shift from, oh, there's a drug, there's a small molecule I can approve or disapprove to a process. How are you gonna make that cellular therapy? What is your CAR-T process? Are you gonna extend yeah. the telomeres of your cells that you're mortalizing in your petri dish before you put them back in the human? Ooh, what, you know, how do I get my head around that when every patient's therapy is different? Every single one. The yeah. next one. Right? It's not a thing, mm. it's a process. So it, that, mm. that's why I say they need to be re-engineered. And I don't know if the crisis, unfortunately, this time around was bad enough to get them to change really anything. Um, hmm. I hope I hope they will. Hmm. Yeah, no, good make point. Like, inherit change, like coming out of this, that we have a more efficient FDA. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, you know, it's amazing, Mick, how so many of these conversations come back to being prepared to live in a world of complex systems or, or, or complexity and uncertainty. Uh, uh, as we kind of got into this, Steve, we realized more and more that we took inspiration from all the work going on at the Santa Fe Institute, yeah. uh, which, by the way, has published prodigiously in all of this, because oh. the, the very fact that the, mm -hmm. here you have the scientific process every week learning new stuff, and then it's changing its opinion about what works or what to try, and to the public, this looks like people don't know what they're doing, or then creates the you know political stuff, we'll see they were stupid, but in fact, it's just, as Kevin Kelly told us probably on our fourth show, it is it is science working far faster uh, than mm. than we're used to, and you know not and and not in time to build a consensus while all of the eyes are on it. And now what we're describing here is we're designing we're designing for complexity, but we still have regulatory systems that are based very much in the product world. And we're in this across the board. We just see that we're in this in this phase change. And the whole conceit of this show was kind of this. Change is happening, and I mean, uh, even this very episode was in three acts, right? There was this first act where everybody shocked and went home, and how do we social distance, and how will we deal with this? And if you look at the first couple of weeks of quarantine, everyone's like, well, this is strange. We're all at home. What do we do, and who do we talk to? And then mm -hmm. the second phase was when we come out, it won't be normal, and will downtowns be there, and will restaurants be there, and we're all going to work at home, and oh, we're suddenly looking at this inequality, all this stuff that we've seen. And then when we look out slightly further in this five to 50 year time frame, we realize the framing in which we look at stuff has to change. And then what's annoying is um, we're politically divided. So like, how would you bring that up without getting yelled at? Uh, but that's actually next week's show. So we don't have to solve that one right now. Um, I do want to point out that it's 525. Um, yeah. we, as everyone who's ever watched this show knows, this is a one hour show that generally goes to about an hour and a half or so. So <laughs> this is the point at which we say, if you have other commitments because it's a Friday night, over Memorial Day weekend, whatever that means these days, people are, are free to go and we can continue. And a reminder that when we're back on Wednesday, the show will be building the world of tomorrow together. Um, a week ago Wednesday, when we when we had uh, 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 Lisa on from Minerva University and what was the name of the guy from, and Martin Reeves from BC Martin Chiefs. Martin Reeves, yeah. Martin, who's a management expert who was talking about how we're moving towards the system thinking. And then we had a recent graduate from Minerva University. And where we ended up was we needed to get her and her friends from around the world together to kind of, how would you collaboratively work, build solutions, actually, you know, aggregate prizes and 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 collaborate on building what's next, right? Then, then we had last Friday's show where we looked at all sorts of mechanisms that were bringing together uh, online forums and entertainment and entertainers and and you know bringing entertainers into 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 Fortnite and World of Warcraft to kind of build global audiences and today we're talking about technology next week we're going to get down to the business of how do we actually build kind of a global workforce on this and we're going to have a number of of uh, of guests who have been working that and working platforms for that so that's but that's that's coming any, after I, I'd like to ask Andrew or Steve any last um, last words last comment something we didn't ask you wish you wish we did Hmm. Oh, uh, Steve, Steve you need to go off bar. of mute yeah. Uh, yeah. because these voices, these scientific voices are important right now. I know you want to read my lips. Like how, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can't read my lips like how. I, you know, I think I should say something a little more uplifting, you know, after the downer of, you know, the golden age of viruses and pandemics. Um, and that is that we also in an incredible renaissance of opportunity and these these ways in which we do engineering, this, this, whether it's deep learning, machine learning, whether it's generative design coming out of Autodesk, whether it's genetic programming or even directed evolution, high throughput experimentation, biological evolution, all of these have in common that they're iterative algorithms that allow you to compound complexity um, that transcend the antecedents. In other words, you can create, they're the only way 
we've ever been able to create something more complex than that which created it, right? The only way a human has created something beyond human understanding, the only way that we can engineer it in a way that transcends our own limits. So in my mind, it's the only way, again, looking at 50 years, that you would get to, you know, an AI worth, you know, considering intelligent. The only way you get to designing biological systems that perhaps are robust and resilient and don't run amok within our information systems of biology. And, and increasingly, as we do, as we have knocked off all the easy problems, most engineering, most software is generated by a machine, meaning it's one of these iterative algorithms, like 90% of all software generated at Google is through a deep learning like methodology that is not a human creating something of purposeful design, something they can understand, something they can prove is safe. Some, it's fast, cheap and out of control back in the old Rodney Brooks sense. So while it can seem scary, it's also the inevitable future. It's the way most complex systems will be built. We will trust our lives to it every day if we drive an autonomous car or go on an airplane flight because the majority of your flight is driven by a machine. Um, that is our future. And the questions that it begs on a regulatory front um, are definitely worth asking, but you statistically can show that there's just better way of doing everything. There'll be safer cars, we'll have better therapies, uh, we'll have personalized therapies. And again, we have to shift the locus of learning um, as humans, as agents of change from the things we try to make to the process of creation itself. And if we focus all of our learning, how can we create better? How can we be a better parent? How can we create a better AI? How can we grow a better virus? Um, how can we iterate with our immune system in a more productive way? That's where the future lies. And I think it's no better time to be a student of these uh, subjects. Mm. I, I'll pick up on that, Steve, because uh, again, you've been at the forefront of so many of these technologies so early because of the way you, your curiosity and, and I think joy in exploring the fringes. Um, the thing that has really, uh, has, has has become part of me now uh, with my time at Autodesk was just appreciating how much of the world is manufactured, how much it takes effort and and really sophisticated tools to manufacture the world around us. And and what I absolutely love is is biology is the most sophisticated form of manufacturing. Uh, Self assembly is is magical. Uh, particularly when you're building it from uh, from elemental materials, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. Um, so, so the fact that we are now getting um, the right software tools, again, many of them will be AI based and, and far, uh, aggregate our human intelligence and processes uh, to be able to harness this, this manufacturing platform called life to meet the needs of humanity, whether it's food, clean air, water, uh, medicines, uh, materials, I think is, is really remarkable. And so we're right on this cusp of now being able to, to start to program these printers. The, the, uh, the cell is a printer. And, and I think it's just gonna be a remarkable few, few decades as, we, as, as our knowledge concentrates and is used to train the software systems to, to direct these incredibly powerful manufacturing plants uh, that we call cells. And I, I just think it changes everything about this century. And, and if I, I, wish I, was, I wish I was 10 years old again so that I could start diving in and, and learning how to, how to program these systems. Uh, with a with a completely blank mind and no no legacy uh, baggage from from how I know how difficult it is to deal with regulatory and economic and other systems today that are that are just not up to the up to speed. <laughs> but yeah, um, teach a lot of kids, and and I, I think that this is going to be just a, an amazing amazing few decades. Oh, uh -huh. very nice. Hey, yeah. Peter, um, I just want to point out, um, Omid, can you pull up the whiteboard? I just want to, everyone might notice that this is this was our conversation today. Steve Jervitson talking a bit about kind of his thesis and what was going on and the only way we're really going to transcend ourselves. And Andrew talking about these sort of phases to get to actually whole genome engineering. Um, this is actually massive um, collaborative. Anybody can log into the Miro and be able to draw, add notes to it. And it, and it pulls back and kind of has all of the episodes that we've ever had um, in here. So um, next week, we're gonna actually invite you to join it and add some ideas. Uh, so um, thanks for joining. And I just thought it'd be fun to kind of say, if, you, if anybody wants the sketch notes on it, 
um, click on that little button on our on our archive site. Back to you, Peter. The, boy, we could just go on and on. And um, uh, you know, Steve, I could I could ask you questions about how startups are responding, and also uh, wh where you stand, and whether everybody's been working at home or going back to the office. Actually, let me just ask you that one question. Oh, okay? you're not. This is the overtime. You're just going to go for it another is four hours. I'm just gonna, I just want to. I would just love that. Yeah, but just I couldn't help myself. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes Mickey, we can't help ourselves. Uh, where do you come out on this whole bit of are we being trained to work from home or are we going to go right back to the office because that's where creativity happens? Well, I think on the margin, some people, again, pushed past that activation energy, realized that A, these meetings work about 80% as good as in person without the commute. B, they start yeah. on time because people aren't waiting for everyone else to show up as often yeah. in the physical space. Um, there is a certain wisdom of crowds you lose when you're not bouncing ideas off in this sort of you know small group setting. Um, I personally want to go back to my office because it's a space museum and I kind of like being there. Um, <laughs> but that's just me. I think a lot of people are thinking about dialing it back and looking at distributed work um, much more interestingly and then getting past the first hurdle of just recapitulating the office environment online, but thinking about different ways of doing distributed work in written form that is better for introverts and better for you know eking productivity out of a larger group of people. So I think there could be some, again, force people to change their behavior, then they realize, wait, this is a better way of doing things. Speaking of space museums, SpaceX is launching astronauts next week. Woo Wednesday. I'm going to be there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Yeah. All right. So that that is Thank Wednesday. You, it's, are you? Is mm -hmm. that is that um, from? Is that from the where? From Canaveral. Yeah. From Canaveral. From Good. Pad 39A, where Apollo 11 launched. Right. What um, time is the launch? 4:34 p.m. Uh, East Coast time. That's okay. Well, maybe we'll check mm -hmm. in with you. Yeah, one thirty um, West Coast. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, maybe we'll check in with you and have it. He's not going to take our call if he's sitting in Cape Canaveral. Hell no. Giant no, but afterwards, he's going to be really <laughs> excited happening. when yeah. we're on. Okay, yeah. gentlemen, thank you for taking us through to um, this great transition point. We're heading into Memorial Day weekend. Whatever the first phase of whatever we've been through has been. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, who even knows time anymore? Uh, Steve, what we've learned is on a micro basis, we're all on time because we live in a broadcast clock. Every meeting starts on the hour. On a broader case, this has been a liminal experience. We've all been thrown into this cauldron of change, and we don't even recognize, like, there is no time left. But you've helped us all frame this, both in the 50-year time frame and in the time frame of what we all have to do when we go back to work, whether we do it from home or from the office. And we will continue this on Wednesday in this uh, Building the World of Tomorrow. Uh, we'll have Dr. Panway Gibson. We'll have James Hanous, who's one of the great innovators and has been organizing global innovation communities. And Dan Mapes, who runs Versus, which is a, uh, a, a, a virtual world collaboration environment that's built on top of, of Unity. We're starting to think of what are global collaboration mechanisms where we can actually harness uh, all the crowd and all the energy that sees this opportunity and starts collectively working on it, almost as a force for science and a conspiracy for good versus, say, the more anti-science elements that are like kind of looking for leadership here. That comes next week as we begin the second season of quarantine. You just made that up. It's not, there's no season. We're in Blur's Day. This is like, <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. All right. I love it. It is a second well, season. Go. We're going to see a lot of changes. It's going to be huge. And, uh, and Mick, you and I will be back on Wednesday. Steve will be at Cape Canaveral. Nice. And Andrew, you'll be messing with the smallest structures on Earth taking us to the future. Pet virus. I, I, I that, love the idea of exploring inner space. But, yeah. Yeah, outer space is... Oh, this is good. We've so got many more space rockets. Space. Yeah. 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 So much better. <laughs> and with that, with that incredible dynamic range at, at multiple orders of magnitude, <laughs> it is 536 Pacific Quarantine. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you Next week. Also, thank you to Drew Youngs, who has created, we have to acknowledge Drew at the end of our broadcast, who created our theme music uh, and has styled uh, what, what Steve Jervison points out is absurdly positive music built to a big band styling to remind us that it's, it's going to be bigger and brasher tomorrow. It's sort of a 50s throwback jingle, I think, which is nice. Yeah. It, it really was good. specifically styled to be that. <laughs> okay. Omid, take Thanks. us out. Thanks, everybody. Mm. Let's get close but not so close for a time. We can share from a distance for a time. You know we want to see each other. We'll have to stay in your own time space while we draw.
Oh, my God.